Today is Monday, September 21st, 2015. My name is Juliana Nicolasian with the Oklahoma State University Library. I'm in Shawnee, Oklahoma, Pottawatomie County today interviewing Mr. Jim Lowe as part of our Cowboys in Every County Oral History Project. Mr. Lowe, thank you for joining me today. Well, you're more than welcome. I'd like to start and little, learn a little bit more about you. Could you tell me the year you were born and where you were born? I was born in Oklahoma City at the Old Mercy Hospital in 1936 on December 22nd. And tell me a little bit about your parents. Uh, my dad was working at that time for uh, the Oklahoma City Health Department. Mom had uh, been in school in Alva, and that's where dad met her. Uh, dad graduated from OSU in 1927. And he was on the National Livestock Judging Team in, in Chicago, uh, which I found out from one of the old SU magazines that came through years later. Uh, he had a brother and a sister that also graduated from OSU. In fact, Fred Lowe has a building in the Anvil Husbandry Department named after him. So I, I had some orange blood in my background, but most of it uh, came later because Dad never pushed me, even though he'd sit and listen to football and basketball games on the radio, and I'd sit in the living room and listen with him. Uh, I guess I was a normal kid because it was a great, great time of life to grow up and he didn't lock doors and worry about things. Attended uh, class in high school and uh, graduated in 1955. Considered going to OU because I was very interested in architecture and after visiting down there, I kind of lost my interest. Uh, but I knew that OSU had a, or a and had a uh, architecture school and the, Several of my good friends were going up there, and so it was an easy choice to make. We got up there in the fall of 1955, and we went through Rush, and they moved us all into Cordell Hall for a week. And it was in a little better shape then than it is now, which I think it's on the demolition list, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, it was quite a, quite a structure at that time. Uh, anyway, uh, Several of us played Cap Sig and uh, we're still in touch and some of us get together once a month and have lunch and had a lot of fond memories. A lot of wild stories are still told. <laughs> well, let's let's back up just a little bit Okay. Um, and talk a little bit more about growing up in Oklahoma City. Did you have siblings? No. No, I'm spoiled wrong. <laughs> that, uh, but I had a lot of good friends, and you know, we'd ride our bicycles everywhere. It was a good life. We could ride our bikes up to the Villa Theater on 23rd Street for 10 cents, go in at 10 in the morning, and watch all kinds of cartoons and films and serials and a movie, and get out about four in the afternoon. And uh, you'd go in, and it was a nice sunny day, and you'd come out. It was snowing or raining, but you had a long, had a mile to ride on your bicycle, and. Uh, Boy Scout troop met at our uh, Penn Avenue Methodist Church, and uh, probably the greatest thing we did was when uh, we got a new, a new troop leader who had captained a PT boat in World War II, and we just would sit around. He was also our Sunday school teacher, and he could tell the greatest stories, and we'd just be enthralled because we, we are all still. Young when the war was over, but we could certainly remembered it. And you couldn't go to a movie without seeing a newsreel about the war and all the efforts and everything that was going on. And our neighbor that was hoarding tires. Uh, well, I'm starting to remember some things I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, went on to uh, let's see, Hawthorne, Hawthorne Grade School. Old Hawthorne Gorillas played a lot of baseball and Taft Junior High played some more baseball. Then started working and throwing, throwing papers. Uh, one of the things about throwing papers in those days, you had a morning route and you had an evening route. And uh, ride our bicycles to them and pick up our papers at 4.30 in the morning. And we'd have to go around and collect from people every well, summer on a weekly basis and some on a monthly basis. So every Saturday we'd usually have our, our collections in our, in our paper bag. And some guy pulled me over one morning and, accused me of breaking into his car, and I said, no, I haven't. 
And he said, let me see in your bag. The next thing I knew, my bag was empty and he was gone. Uh, Dad bailed me out, thank goodness. But a church all the way across on the other side of Oklahoma City saw it in the paper. And uh, they sent somebody to the paper station for me. And I thought, well, you know, people I didn't even know. And I thought, this is, this is a good, going to be a good life. And How much would you make uh, throwing papers? Uh, maybe $35 a month, something like that. But uh, all the papers I could read. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and then Dad would start letting me drive when I was 14. But, uh, of course, I'd been driving on my uncle's farm, but uh, this was a little different. But at 4.30 in the morning, it wasn't much of a problem, so, particularly after I got robbed. <laughs> but a lot of fun. In fact, one of the, one of the guys that uh, was in our fraternity and uh, had lunch with my, once a month was, uh, was the station manager. So uh, <laughs> we, we'd go duck hunting after we got through throwing papers in the mornings. And, Sometimes go fishing and get out on the Canadian riverbed and go through where the dry holes were, find the fish that were trapped in there. And, uh, was, the worst part about the duck hunting was cleaning the ducks. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I guess that didn't really suit me because I remember mother wringing chickens' necks in the backyard. And here we were right in the middle of Oklahoma City. It was a good life, a good time to grow up. Would you ride the streetcars? Oh yes, they ran right by our house. And I mean, to go take my guitar lessons, would have to ride the streetcar downtown and then catch another one that would go up to where the teacher's house was. And I don't know why Mom was going with me when I first started, but uh, I would be carrying the guitar for a while and she'd carry it for a while. And she stubbed her toe on one of the little little turtles that they used to make turn lanes or safety lanes and steal things on the ground, on the pavement. Stubbed her toe and fell and scraped her knees and dropped my guitar and all that. But the biggest thing about the streetcars was the night they quit running. Because they'd come by the house about once, a, once an hour. And you just wouldn't pay any attention. And the night they quit running, I'd wake up every hour. But, uh, because it's been part of my life. And I don't know, they're going back to it, but they have big rubber tires on them, I guess. <laughs> but they were allowed. Great memories. Thank you for bringing some of those up. <laughs> Was education very important in your family? Uh, well, Dad, had, Dad and Mom both had, had degrees. Mm -hmm. Dad was from A&M, and, and hers was from, was it Garvey? And that, in fact, that's where Dad met, met Mom, because he was he was teaching Boag or something up there at Carver, and that's where he met Mom, because she was still in school there. Uh, so I would say, yes, they, they made sure I had decent grades, and it wasn't difficult. Uh, I guess I made all the honor rolls, I don't remember. Uh, would they take you to visit? And um, as you were growing not, up, not not at that age, mm -hmm. no. But like I said, Dad was always listening to the ball games, and I'd sit in there and listen with him. So uh, I don't remember going to Stillwater at that age. Uh, after I decided to go up there, Dad drove me up there, and uh, I guess he went with me when went on the road, and then to get books, and he had been in school with a guy named Swim that uh, had Swim's Drug. It's over on the corner of, well, it'd be Catty Corner from where Eskimo Joe's is now. Mm -hmm. And he had a pool hall upstairs and he and Dad were friends. And uh, so Dad took me by there and I sat there and listened to them talk for, <laughs> seemed like hours, but I guess it wasn't that long. And uh, I think he had some, I think we bought some of their books there you know, at that time. Um, so that's the first time I remember being up there with Dad. He came up, and Mom both came up after us in school. And, uh, come up occasionally for football games or pick me up so we could go hunting. But uh, yes, I think education was very important in their minds. Mm -hmm. but, uh, they said they made sure I got up every morning and went. 
Was there anything that sparked your interest in architecture growing up? Uh, well, I'd taken mechanical drawing classes, which I enjoyed, and uh, I guess I'd always been sketching little things, either I've still got some of the things around Dad's little profile or something, and I remember doing a, some type of gold mining operation in Alaska that I'd copied off of something. And so yeah, I guess I really did have more than I realized, and then I had a, had a good friend in high school that was very serious about architecture and has been quite successful at it in Houston. But uh, yeah, I've, I've just always enjoyed looking at, at things, and, and some photography classes probably added to that. Uh, I, yeah, I didn't, know, didn't think I could be any good at it because I wasn't real good at math. I guess they don't even use it anymore, they think it's on computers. But, uh, yeah, I was, was interested in, I didn't like calculus, and I decided I better look at something else. <laughs> and that, that was an easy decision, you know, it was just, I'm glad it didn't work out. So when you, when you first came to OSU as a student, how did you get there your freshman year? How did you get from... Oklahoma City to Stillwater. Okay. Uh, Dad had bought 55 Ford Fairway. And I had to pick up two other guys with him. That's how we went up. Because he had a city car, so that, there was no problem to loan me the car for a while. And, uh, there were several, several guys that just depended on me to get them, get them there and get them home. You were a popular guy with a set of wheels. It got that way. Uh, I don't remember if they ever bought me any gas or not. Of course, the gas was what, nine cents, so wasn't much. But, uh, and there weren't a lot of cars on campus either. Mm -hmm. but, uh, this, I, I can't imagine trying to find a parking place today up there. It's bad enough at a football game or basketball game. And then eventually that helped me. Oh, because I joined the Army Reserves in, in high school, so I had some income from that too. And uh, that saved my paper money. And bought a 52 Chevrolet. And it served the same purpose as the Ford Fairlane there, it was older and smaller. <laughs> and headed all the way through school. Well, you, you rushed Kappa Sig early on. Mm -hmm. How did you choose Kappa Sig, or did they choose you? Well, I guess it's a matter of both. Uh, the guy I threw papers with uh, was Kappa Sig. And I remember going over to their house. Of course, it was impressive because they had a brand new house. It was 1955, and they were just moving into it. And I remembered when I was at Philmont Scout Branch, I guess when I was a freshman in high school, one of the, one of the uh, counselors or camp leaders or whatever he was, this big old hairy guy named J. Roy Embody. And I remembered him for the next four years because I was so impressed with the guy and he was so helpful in guiding us and helping us poke the mules up the mountain and all that stuff. And we're sitting out there on the front front porch of the Kappa Sigma house, and I don't know who I was talking with, and they said something about Boy Scouts, and I said, yeah, Philmont was one of the greatest memories I have, and I still remember a guy out there named J. Roy Embody. He said, well, he's right over there inside the door. <laughs> of course, he didn't remember me from Adam, but uh, that, that, that added to it, that just made me feel real comfortable there. And, and as it turned out, even though we didn't know it, three of us uh, at all had been buddies all the way through high school and all the way back to grade school. Ended up there at the same time. We're still in touch. Mm -hmm. Worked out real well. Of course, that was a &M. and <laughs> And you didn't live right away in the Kappa Sig house. No. You lived in Cordell. 
Well, that was just for Rush. Okay. So as soon as Rush, we had had bid house in Cordell, I believe mm -hmm. it was, where we'd go down and pick up who might be interested in us. Okay. And uh, and then marched over to the Cap Stick House and brought our stuff and moved right in. <laughs> and, uh, and pledging was a little different in those days, too. How so? <laughs> Well, you had to keep your room clean, your beds made, you had to clean the house every Saturday night, um, had to keep the phones answered, uh, learn some t decent, you know, excellent table manners. That uh, was a very big thing with the house mothers. You really would, you'd always dread when you were assigned to sit at her table. But, Today I, I appreciate it because I felt like I could sit down at a press initial dinner and not make a faux pas on which fork to use or what. But, uh, learned a lot. Of course, kids today have so much more in the world than we did at that time. You know, they, and of course, that television made a world of difference. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, we did have TV, but it wasn't what it is today. <laughs> so that. I feel like it was just a great thing for me because my life had been limited, but I didn't have a lot of world experience other than a little, little bit after I got in the Army Reserves. It, uh, it's, I think it's been a good, a good guide for my life. So your, your house mom was pretty tough? Well, she was, I wouldn't say tough, but Stern. Do you remember her name? Mother Bruce. <laughs> it, uh, we even got a wedding gift from her. She was, she, after she retired, she moved with her daughter out to New Mexico. But she stayed in touch with a lot of us through the years. And, uh, of course, you know, everybody would always be bad, bad now. And of course, she made us play straight. And uh, I guess one guy got in trouble because he came in a little intoxicated one night and went in her room and fell asleep on her couch. That didn't go over too big. <laughs> but, uh, she was a sweet lady. Taught some great lessons. And I don't think the young guys are learning all that today. But, uh, of course, I'm sure all old people say that. <laughs> did, you, did you live in the house all four years? Uh, I had an apartment one year. Okay. It's a uh, little garage apartment and we like to starve to death in it because we weren't, there's just two of us. <sighs> well, of course, nothing was air conditioned, so that wasn't the issue. Probably the biggest shock of my life is when I came back. I had gone active in the Army and went to OCS and got a commission and came back in 1957 and I no longer lived on College Avenue. It was University Avenue, and I couldn't find the right address for a while, but so. So actually, I've been to two, two colleges and universities for my degree. Mm -hmm. I don't think that helps a bit. <laughs> when did you leave for OCS? Uh, that would have been in 50... 57. I was only gone six months. Okay. But, uh, but anyway, I, I like that reserve money. It certainly, mm -hmm. helped, certainly helped out. And it, uh, it, I thought I was going to be going to war a few times. It all worked out. So, mm -hmm. uh, well, let's talk about some of the classes and professors you remember. I had one business class with a guy named Pedro Riongo. So his name's more, no more strange than yours, but he, uh, he was brutal. And I couldn't hardly understand him. And fortunately, he'd break us up into study groups. And then we'd have a case to, to go work out for some corporation if something was going wrong. So there'd be about four or five of us that would get together and, and work on it. And fortunately, one of the guys in my group, his last name was Bat, B-A-T-T. -T. He, he was from 
in India. And he could understand the guy much better than the rest of us could. So I gave us a little bit of edge, but it was a fun class. And, uh, in fact, Dave Cawthon, uh, a friend of ours that's since passed away, so, was in that class. But Dave was president of the OCU for a while, and then president. Did quite well. So he got more out of that class than I did. Uh, I remember an econ class where uh, one of the older guys in the fraternity was, uh, was a student instructor. And I walked in there one day and he was in charge, instructor, I can't remember who the guy was supposed to be. But anyway, Phil was there to, to take the class that day and he threw a pop quiz, a quiz on us. And I had not a clue what it was about. Uh, so I just wrote on my paper, if you turned your paper in, at least you were credited for being there. And so I just wrote on my paper, punt. <laughs> Got the paper back to the next class, said, field goal, three points. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, I enjoyed the econ class. It was a sociology class with a guy named May, Dr. May. He was from up north somewhere. And uh, turned out he was a cap sick wherever he came from. So I don't know if he showed us any favoritisms or not. But it was an interesting class. And I think that was the one we met over in Old Central. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know it's been beefed up since then because it was so rickety and you just knew there were ghosts hanging around you and all that. And, uh, I'm sure there's others if I could come up with them. But anyway, I, after my uh, freshman year, I passed everything. I had to get freshman year out of the way. Of course, that time I had to go to Roxy, go over there, and check our rifles out of the armory. There was a swimming pool in the armory at that time. Uh, I didn't know they didn't get to use it. You do a lot of drilling? Yeah. But I'd already done it all in the reserve, so I was the squad captain or whatever it was, squad leader. And uh, that, that helped because I'd already been through it all. <laughs> Mostly down at Fort Hood one summer. That, that's another story I just soon forget. Uh, classes. I guess I remember more about, I found the library my senior year that uh, learned that you could study and be real quiet over there. But in the Union at that time, I think the, was it the French lounge, there was a French lounge and a Chinese lounge. And one of them was gone now, I'm not sure which one. But that was always a good place to go study, but it was always, always quiet. And, uh, and both, both buildings were relatively new. Yes, the Union was, was extremely new, and mm -hmm. I think even then it was uh, supposedly the largest in the world. Of course, it's been added on to many, many times. The hotel was there uh, with a good restaurant. We could, it's hard to get in on Sundays because none of the houses had, had meals, so you had to go find someplace else to eat. And there was a bowling alley in the basement. I remember going down there one time. It was with some of the football players. And I still had on a shirt. And a tie, a pin collar tie that you put the pin through and the tie kind of hangs down over it. And I was trying to show what a proficient bowler I was to these football jocks. And I don't know how in the world I did it, but as soon as I released the ball, I turned my head and that collar just blew up, <laughs> exploded. And they're looking at me like, what in the world is that guy doing? <laughs> and it uh, was Dwayne Wood, and I can't remember who else. Yeah, there was always something going on in the union. That, uh, dances, there was, there was there's a freshman dance, I remember. There was one dance, I had a date with a girl from Shawnee, and somehow we got locked out on the roof. Uh, 
because there was nothing on the roof at that time except air conditioners and equipment. And I guess we finally made enough noise. I don't think it was her. I think it was me making a lot of noise to somebody come up and open the door for us. Yeah, it was, she, you went to high school with her. Beanies? We wore a beanie here. First week mm -hmm. as a freshman. How'd that go for you? Well, nobody's real proud of the beanies. Mm -hmm. was, but there was somebody who had started the whole thing about Howdy Week. Mm -hmm. And I still do Howdy Week. I don't know. But uh, yeah, you had your beanie, and particularly the other beanie wearers, you'd always want to say howdy to. Yeah. But, uh, but I don't think they lasted the whole week. Hmm. What else? Let's go to another question. Did you stay in architecture? No. So what did you end up changing your major so, uh, to? So after my first semester of architecture, I, I went to uh, general business. Okay. And that's where I finally got my degree. But, uh, and of course, that's, I ended up in, in production management, uh, which I think has, has helped to some of the things I've done my, during my lifetime, uh, I think it made me be more efficient in ways I do things with fewer steps or movements, particularly now that I'm not able to take as many steps or whatever. But, uh, but it, it worked, worked out well. Did you have a good advisor in business? I'm trying to, I was just trying to remember. I'm, I'm sure I did because I got through it. So I, I'd say, Yes, but I can't, can't remember him. And I, I know I didn't have a lot of contact with him. I know where his office was. Uh, fortunately, I never got called to people's offices like I did in high school. Yeah. Did you attend many sporting events? I went to the football and some of the basketball and some of the wrestling. How was Lewis Field back then? Well, it was a rust bucket. Uh, and some of the football players and basketball players had little apartments under the North Stands. And that was a wild place. Was one, one of our guys, Matt, Car Matt Carter, lived over there. And I think J.W. Mashburn lived over there. And, you know, some guys that I knew they ended up known later. Uh, I just loved to hear their stories. <laughs> And of course, Iba was the little, little, small Iba, uh, the head of the little track underneath and the workout area for the wrestlers, and it was just, oh, it was a dungeon. It was, I don't know why the guys put themselves through it to have to go down there. Uh, there was a baseball batting cage, and anything going on, it'd always stir up the dust, and you'd almost choke trying to get up out of there to get some air. Let's see. Well, it was the night that uh, we beat Wilt Chamberlain and the Jayhawks. Uh, of course, everybody was packed in, in the other eye, but there was little windows right up at the top that would open. And uh, of course, there's no way they could meet any type of safety restrictions. <laughs> it must have been 100 degrees in there. But, uh, that was, that was one wild night. It went on all night. But, uh, I guess the big wrestling night was after we graduated. When Dr. Mitch pinned Dr. Death for OU and that, that tore the house down. But, uh, Would you have many walkouts back then? No, not that I remember. Okay. I can't even, I don't. I think we still had class after we beat uh, Kate Ewan and Wilt that time. Hmm. You don't call panty raids walkouts. No, right? no, no. Okay. no. Yeah, we had those. Um, nobody ever knew what started them or why, but everybody showed up. <laughs> so with, with panty raids, I've heard varying stories about how they happen. Well, I heard stories because I wouldn't be involved in any of that. Well, <laughs> so why don't explain explain how it works to me? Well, the way I remember it, there's a couple of guys. Was it Stout or Murray Hall? Somehow got in, 
whether they were let in, I, I don't know. But that's what started it. And, and how it spread so fast, I have no idea. But it, everybody, everybody was out watching to see what was going on. And I don't know, I never saw anything. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody thought it was a big deal. And I'm sure some people have better stories on it than that. You never ended up in the Dean of Men's office then? No. Now there was Dean Troxell that was over the Men uh, Fraternity Council and all that, but that was usually to go drink beer or something with him. So that was, uh, no, I was never. In fact, the only time I ever went to the principal's office in high school <laughs> was there was a. I went all the way from grade school through high school with another guy named Jim Love. He was Jimmy Benjamin and I was Jimmy Douglas. And, but everything else was just Jim Love. So the time I was called to the principal's office, it was for Jimmy Benjamin. So anyway, he went to, to OU and I went to a &M. And I think that was my junior year. And I, I had to sit some you know, clothes to the, to the cleaners. And they didn't come back. And I, I went down to the cleaners and I asked about my clothes. And they said, well, the show's right here. We took them to the Lamb Kai house. I said, well, why? And I went over to the Lamb Kai house, and there was Jim Lowe. <laughs> he had, had transferred up there. So we finished up together. He's a dentist, or a retired dentist now. But <laughs> he's a good guy. You'd have to with a name like that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> How were homecomings in the 50s? Oh, they were, I can't say they were bigger. There were, uh, there were a lot more floats than there are today. Uh, just, you know, they just priced themselves plumb out of everything. Mm -hmm. But uh, I remember working on floats with the Thetas. Another, another guy and I had to go find a Jeep so we could use it to build build a float around. And we, we scoured the countryside full of kind of, you know, we'd drive up to a farmhouse and say, you have a Jeep? <laughs> uh, we finally found one and uh, they helped him build a float. He'd be up all night and it would rain and start all over. Uh, the house decks were a little easier, but uh, then I remember we had one. And this, our theme, I can't remember what the overall theme was, but ours was the railroad runs through the middle of the house. <laughs> and uh, so we <laughs> built this big big engine with a little car behind it and uh, I can't remember what was supposed to be moving. We had a lot of mechanical parts. And it's, it's a lot more advanced today than all the wet, you know, they build steel frames and weld them and all of that. But everything we did was pretty much with the wood. But uh, it, it was big and you know, the parade was huge. Mm -hmm. uh, and then all of the floats end up you know, outside the football stadium over there. You know, a lot like still today is that the floats were just, you know, at the time I thought this could be in the Rose Parade. You know, wow. Uh, it was really some fine, fine stuff. Hmm. And it was a fun way to meet more people too. Mm -hmm. yeah, but, uh, and then you'd go sit up there at the ball game and fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it was nicer as you became an upperclassman. And of course you had the pledges doing all that all the hard work. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, it, it was it was a good time. And, and of course, the, the campus is so much bigger today than it was then. But uh, still, the walk arounds and all the all the stuff and and change. I remember we were on it years after. Well, it was in the eighties for homecoming, and we'd been active with uh, some of the Ike Gross's women's tennis program. And in fact, there's a picture of them up here somewhere. Anyway, one of the gals that had been uh, on Ike's team 
had come back for homecoming, and she saw us driving by. I don't know why she recognized the car even, but she was she jumped out in the street, hollered and yelling. She was out of Louisiana, and uh, so you always see somebody. Mm -hmm. just, uh, it's just, I think it's as friendly today as it was then. Really mm -hmm. uh, well. Yeah. Outside of the fraternity, were you involved in any other organizations? Uh, the Redskin. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think uh, I think three different semesters I worked on the Redskin staff. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember doing much, but I'd go to their meetings and, and all that. And of course, pledges were had to go out and do something on, on the campus. And there, there's a guy in our Sunday school class that has every edition of the Redskin from up to the closed when it shut down early 60s, I think. No, late 60s. Uh, and he had them all the way back from whenever they started back in, in the 20s. And it was interesting because we'd go back with some of the guys that I knew that their dads had gone to school there. And one, in fact, he was my little brother in the Cab Sig house. His dad and my dad were acacias at the same time. We found them in an old yearbook. Hmm. Uh, I guess acacia's gone now. But, hmm. uh, I think it's, oh, it's an annex for the Beta House. But, uh, what was it? The acacias? Mm -hmm. Well, since I was never initiators by them, it, I want to say it was sponsored by the, the Masons. Okay. Uh, my, I, dad, my dad was a Mason, and he put me into joining the Malays, and I never went any further with it. But that somehow Acacia branched off of that. So how Masonic it is, uh, I, I really... Okay. But, hmm. uh, if you ever interview a Mason, he can probably tell you. Hmm. But I do remember selling an old boat I had to an acacia. So I knew they were good guys. He paid me for it. <laughs> they got me around Carl Blackwell a few times. <laughs> Are there any campus traditions that come to mind? Campus traditions? See, <laughs> Seems like everything I, I see or do is a campus tradition. <laughs> tailgating wasn't anything. I don't remember any tailgating. Uh, there could have been some, but uh, of course there was always the wave. <laughs> we've got that, but now we've got OSU and all the things that we're doing now. It's an OU will pick up something on it a couple of years later. But uh, we've always been a leader. Of course, homecoming is a tradition. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think you know, the, the basketball, the way they do some things in, in the basketball games, there's tradition about running the flag around and, and, and those things. Did you ever get thrown in Theta Pond? No, but I certainly helped some go in. <laughs> that, uh, anytime somebody was pinned or engaged, we'd always have a pond party. Some of them got a little rough. Some of them got a little mad. We all had a lot of fun. <laughs> what was a, a typical date like? Uh, being bashful, I was very nervous. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's, of course, Pledges had, had to go out on coke dates. They, they forced you to, so you'd have to find some somebody to go out on a date with. And then uh, there's always some guy in the house would be dating some girl in another house, and he'd have her find you a date. Uh, there was a, was it the Howdy Dance? I think the first dance as a freshman at the Union. And I, I ended up with a date, a girl, I think her name was Blackman or something. It turns out she was the Dairy Princess from somewhere down in southeastern Oklahoma. And she was a nice girl, about as bashful and shy as I was. And so we just kind of walked, walked around. She had on a formal, and I think I, I don't know if I had on a tux, probably not. 
and we just walk around the union. Occasionally we'd see somebody we knew and we'd talk for a minute and we'd walk around a little more. And then uh, I walked her back to her dorm and walked back to the house. <laughs> that was, I uh, can't think of anything too thrilling in the early days. And did you have a curfew? No. Mm -hmm. The girls did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the guys, the guys didn't. I probably as a pledge, you probably did have to be in at 10 30. Didn't matter if all, of course, you couldn't, they wouldn't let you drink in still water anyway for mm -hmm. your pledge. Unless you got 10 miles out, and that's too far, so you don't, you don't go. Uh, Did you have any interaction with bootleggers? <laughs> <laughs> Funny you should ask that. <laughs> uh, Were you a brute bootlegger? <laughs> <laughs> Funny you should ask that. Uh, Ark City, Kansas. Uh, it was the closest destination, and you'd go around and you'd pick up five dollars from one guy and ten from another, and take their orders and run up there. And we made one run. We were always hearing stories from these guys making big money doing this. And then we started hearing more stories about the guys getting stopped and they'd confiscate their liquor. And it wasn't always the police that did it. <laughs> yeah, I think it was maybe some other guys that were just laying in wait. Uh, so I only made one run, and I think I might have broken even. Uh, with my own supply, anyway. Uh, that was my only story, but there were some, several guys lost a bunch of stuff up there. You were one and done in the bootlegging one, business. Yeah, I thought that's not, that's <laughs> not for me. And it, even after I graduated, one of the buddies, we went in, in northwest Oklahoma City off the northwest highway and pulled in this little, I think it's right on the county line of northwest highway, pulled in this guy's garage. It was a drive through garage. And he'd opened a little window there. B, B gave him the order, held the money up, and he dropped it. And he, Got out of the car to pick the money up, and the guy's big dog came over and bit him on the leg. The guy said, don't ever get out of the car. Wow. So uh, that was our last trip to that bootlegger, too. <laughs> uh, there was one bootlegger on the south side of Stillwater, and you pull up to his farmhouse and give him the order, and he'd get in his truck and drive somewhere back off, down across a pasture and into a bunch of trees. And come back, come back with your order. That uh, that was probably the safest way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Did you work while you were a student? Uh, I was a houseboy. Of course, I was going to reserve meetings and mm -hmm. all that. But, sure. Uh, uh, I was a houseboy primarily in Cap Sig House, which you know, got plenty of food. Mm -hmm. uh, then I worked uh, some in the Beta House and the Kyo House. Uh, I did that all, all the way through up until, up, well, I guess not, not all my senior year. And, yeah, it was, we had, a, in the Cap Sega house, we had a cook named Babe. And Babe was stern. <laughs> if you thought Mother Mother B was stern, Babe was stern. And then, but a real character and fun lover, we had a lot of fun. But, but she, she made you do it right. And, and I, those, those days aren't the same. I don't think they even had many sit-down dinners in the houses anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, we always did lunch and dinner, formal dinners on Monday nights, uh, where you had to wear a tie and all of that. And some of the pledges always had to sit at the front table with the house mother, and nobody sat down until the house mother came in. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it was always some type of, almost a ceremony. <laughs> and we had a, had a prayer we'd all say together. Uh, would you go home often or would your parents visit? Uh, Dad would come up during hunting season. <laughs> that, uh, I probably went home once a month, uh, usually with a bag of laundry. And I guess, you know, after two or three years of it, you go home less. But 
It wasn't an easy drive going to Oklahoma City in those days either because it wasn't an interstate. How long would it take you? Oh, uh, depending on how many stops I make. But uh, it would probably be close to an hour and a half, maybe. Mm -hmm. Because I remember, you know, I'd always have to take one of my buddies home. And I made one trip home. It was late. I'm sure it was on Saturday, Friday or Saturday night. And I woke up and I was somewhere between Guthrie and Oklahoma City. I don't remember going through Guthrie at all. And that, that was kind of scary. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's why I didn't go home too often. But there was, just, there was always something going on. You didn't, you didn't want to miss anything. Uh, that, and, and folks understood that. Uh, and they did come up some. Uh, maybe they, they came up and, and brought my aunt, who was also an alum, uh, when they dedicated a, a building to my uncle. That's the Fred, Fred Lowe. It was in animal husbandry, I guess. That's where Dad was. They came up for that, and then they came up several football games. And then there was a, a De Corsi Dairy. Uh, Dad was a health inspector, and the old gentleman that owned and started the dairy, old man De Corsi, he, Dad brought him up one time to a football game. And he treated us at Whataburger. But, uh, of course, we didn't have a McDonald's that either. But, uh, and the old, that old, the course, the gentleman gave me a, a silver dog, hmm. and I had it for years. I didn't know what ever happened to it, but I was, I was impressed with that. Hmm. What were some of the restaurants you remember from the mid-50s? Uh, there, there, was, there was a cafeteria in the Union, mm -hmm. and then there was a restaurant that tied in with the hotel. You know, it wasn't Athens or Men, I don't know. That was nice. Uh, it was. It was later the Ancestors. It's not even a restaurant anymore on South Main. Uh, I can't remember what it was called originally. And then it became the Ancestor. Of course, Joe was wasn't around. What did we eat? Whataburger. <laughs> it was a chicken place on Main Street. I never was a chicken fan, but there was a, a guy in the Beta House. His mother ran in. Was, was, was the strip still there? Well, it wasn't like today. Mm -hmm. It, uh, what was down there? Let's see, there, I, there was a drive-in restaurant, the, the Aggie, Aggie B, I believe. It was almost down to 6th. There's a bank or something in that area now. But that, that was a fine little drive-by. Would you go to any particular place off campus to have a party or to hang out with friends? Mm, well, let's see, the Anchor was a, was a bar. Mm -hmm. I think it's still there. And then there was, what was it, George's was open then. Hmm. Maybe some of those things are harder to remember because I, I have been inviting. I don't know. Uh, I know there had to be more places to eat. Of course, we always had food at the house. We had served lunch every every day and dinner every night, except uh, Saturdays and Sundays. So there wasn't any. You know, it was paid for. Sorry, you'd already paid for it, so you might as well eat it. Earlier, you mentioned you you were gone for about six months for officer candidate school, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and when you came back, we were at Oklahoma State. Mm -hmm. How did you feel about the name change? Well, fortunately, I didn't have any business cards I had to reprint or anything <laughs> like that. Well, it was an adjustment, but uh, and I probably, you know, for years still said A&M. Okay, I'm, I'm still an Aggie, but, uh, but I was, that was the big thing, was just having to write a new one. 
return address on anything I was, was mailing. Uh, and it was really bad when they changed their phone number from Frontier 2 to whatever, you know, they got rid of Frontier. Telephones, that's something that's changed. Uh, in the Capstick House, we had one phone booth on each floor. And uh, if somebody's on the phone, you can make a call. I mean, you'd sit out on the floor next to them and wait while they're sitting in there on the floor in the phone booth talking to their girlfriend or whatever. And, or you'd try to call somebody at, at, you know, to get a date, and you'd hear them yelling, Susie, you know, hollering and screaming. And, uh, it was really an effort <laughs> to make a phone call in those days. Of course, there was pay phones all over the campus. But uh, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. Of course, you had to dial them. And uh, that was bad on girls' fingernails. That was a talking point. Uh, I'm not sure all the new devices are, they're more like electric leashes now. You mm -hmm. can't get away from them. But it, we didn't know the difference. So it, <laughs> You'd get mad if somebody stayed on the phone too long. You'd try to put time limits on them. It, uh, and once they're out, they're, they're, they're gone because you can't find them because there's no way to call them. So it, it was certainly a different, different time. When you look back to your college years and, and you think of mischief you may or may not have gotten into, what, what comes to mind? When we were pledges, we were getting ready for a formal dance. We were going to have it at the house. And it was the pledge's job to decorate. And I don't know who came up with the idea, but we went out and Coca-Cola had some huge Coke signs, big red Coke signs that were probably five feet in diameter. Could have been bigger. They were big, I know that. Uh, we confiscated three of them and made a, a waterfall on the front porch of the Cap City House and put dry ice in it and it was smoking and all. We thought it was so neat and the members were so proud of us. It was just really sharp. And then the president, who was a Korean War vet. Several of them were had been, been to war, you know, were older guys. When he found out that we had stolen those Coke signs, he lined us all up down in the basement and picked one of those things up over his head. They run at the length of the basement, and yeah, we were in all kinds of trouble. Uh, but then they couldn't find where to take them back, so they stayed stacked in the basement for a while. And then it snowed. And some other brilliant fellow came up with an idea to use them as sleds. So we'd take ski ropes, tie them on behind our cars, and, and go up. There's an old golf course where some of the dorms are now. And that was an inner mirror field, and then there was an old run down golf course. We'd go out there with those sleds and get some thetas or whoever was around wanting to go. And, pile five or six into the sled and if somebody would be holding on the ski rope and off, we'd go over the golf course, slinging them around. Well, all of a sudden we became heroes. <laughs> <laughs> we were forgiven for confiscating the Coke signs. And they stayed up in use for years up there. I don't know what ever happened to them. Hmm. But, uh, then one other, or one of the really mischievous, one, one of the guys, Dad was a pilot for American Airlines, and he was always experimenting doing something. And he made a little, and I think the idea might have come from the Coke signs, but Rick's dad made a plastic shell of a boat. And you could put a little bitty motor on it and it would go really fast. Or you could put a bigger motor on it. <sighs> Jim Wood, that was All-American 1958, had access to probably a 25 or 30, might, might have been a 35 horse Johnson. 
that he brought out. So we went out to Carl Blackwell with it and put that thing on it. And it almost sunk it when we put it on it. Fired it up. I, th I don't remember who was right, who was driving it. But anyway, it just went up, flipped, and of course came down. And of course, the motor fell off and went right to the bottom. <laughs> so our, our next project was to find that motor. Wood was sweating bullets. <laughs> so a couple of guys had some had some scuba gear, and of course it was some muddy. They couldn't find anything. Uh, they tried and they tried. And then another one of our brighter guys came up with an idea of dragging a hay rake around the bottom till we caught something. <laughs> so I don't know where he got the hay rake, but anyway, we hooked it on behind one of the boats. It started dragging that thing around. Well, they'd get all hung up in trees, and then the guys that had their scuba gear would have to go down. And we never found the motor. And I don't know how Jim ever managed to con his way out of not paying for it, but I'm sure he, he handled it some way. But that was another one of our great adventures. That, like Carl Blackwell, was a good, good spot. Uh, had a pig roast out there. One Sunday after we had a formal dance and these two pledges came through. Everybody had on white dinner jackets and bow ties and really spiffy. And here came these two pledges walking in with a pig on a spit between them, marching through announcing our pig roast the next day. So then they had to go out and dig a pit and start a fire about five o'clock the next morning after the dance. And then guys would start showing up about 10 o'clock and you know, some dates would show up later. And I think it was probably well after two before we ever had a pig cook, cook to eat. But by then everybody didn't care anyway. So it was, that was our pig roast. <laughs> and nobody got sick, that was the good thing. <laughs> Well, what was graduation like for you? Well, I actually finished up the fall of 59, and I had to come back in January to take finals. But I was through. Hmm. So when graduation, I was gone. When it, you know, it wasn't until May, I guess, whenever, in, in the spring. Mm -hmm. So I had to go back up for graduation. and. Uh, one of my very good buddies was, was in the same boat, so we got together and went back up there. I remember <laughs> it was it was at Lewis Field, and uh, the folks were up in the in, in the sitting in the stands, and Larry and I, and we walked across the stage, got our diploma, and everybody was turning to go someplace. We turned the other way and cut out. But, uh, we just felt like we didn't belong anymore. We, <laughs> we were already out of school. <laughs> but, uh, in fact, I talked with Larry just last week. He's in Denver. But, uh, no, it, it, you know, it wasn't, wasn't that much because I wasn't going through with my class. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, of course, there wasn't that many others to begin with. Mm -hmm. but, uh, not like today. But, when my granddaughter graduated, but, well, that's probably been 10 years ago when, when you see graduate. It went on forever. We were sitting up there, why did we come to yeah, this? Just, <laughs> just her school. Mm -hmm. yeah, just, yeah, yeah. It was just her, her group. But, uh, well, after you, you finished up at OSU, mm -hmm. take me through what happens next. What did you end up doing? Uh, first thing I did was buy an Austin Haley. But, uh, Got interested in sports car racing, uh, which indirectly uh, led me to meet Charlotte. So uh, that was a good good investment. It uh, turned out quite well. Well, well uh, tell me how you met your wife. No, it was a blind date, but uh, Tommy Wilson, who was deceased now, but uh, Tommy and I were running around together, and I was playing fast pitch softball. And, and Tommy and some of us were bowling and doing different things. And Tommy had met Charlotte when he was 
doing something in Shawnee. I don't. But anyway, he said, I know a girl that's got a, a little MGA sports car. I said, really? And so he, uh, he gave me her phone number, and I called her, and uh, had a blind date. And I'm sure I was late. I was always late for everything. She could probably tell you more, more than that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, they started uh, putting a few little accessories on her car for her and doing some little things, and we started dating pretty regular and got more regular and more regular. And uh, we got married in... Uh, February of 62, and uh, still are. <laughs> well, when you when you were racing cars, where would you race? Uh, I wasn't racing as much as I was working the races. And oh, okay. I did go through some driver schools and did things like that. Uh, we had sports car races at uh, the fairgrounds in Oklahoma City. Uh, we had the Pox City Road Race around, around the lake up there that was really good. Uh, then there was a driver's school at the Air Force Base in Enid. And then I went with some of the, and Charlotte went on several of these trips up to uh, uh, someplace in Kansas. There's one in Alliance, Nebraska, where the hood of the Jag XKE came down on my hand and my fingers left imprints in the hood where it came down. Uh, I can't think of the place in Kansas. But I'd usually be working on somebody's crew and I'd just go out and drive the course or do something like that. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Met a lot of good people. Which included Charlotte. So. Well, what else did you end up doing? Well, I had to work. Mm -hmm. I had to pay for that evening. <laughs> too much fun. Uh, too much, too much fun. So I, I ended up uh, with uh, going to work for Aetna, and uh, not in sales, but in their office management. And talk about a drag, it really, really was. I did get to go to a school up in Hartford, Connecticut, which was an interesting experience. Uh, there's good stories from up there, too. Uh, and my good buddy Larry that walked across the stage with, uh, he was in Philadelphia with INA, so we'd meet in New York and re remember our younger days. And uh, left Aetna after sitting in that office for a while and went to work for Pepsi, Lever Brothers. And uh, well, I was a hot toothpaste salesman. And uh, so that got me to New York several times for some of their meetings and uh, realized that not everybody was brushing their teeth like I thought they should, and they also wanted me to move down to Louisiana somewhere, which didn't interest me at all, uh, particularly since we, I think we're getting ready to have a baby pretty soon anyway. And uh, so I uh, went to Northern Paper Mills, started selling toilet paper, and found out everybody uses toilet paper, so that, that worked out really well. Uh, then American Can Company bought them. So uh, got to go to Green Bay several times. Walked in a bar in Green Bay with a guy one time. Uh, he was from Lubbock, Texas, originally from Nebraska. But he was, John was a big, big guy. And this was a weekend that Green Bay was going to play Minnesota. Baltimore, they're going to play Baltimore. And I had a crew cut and all of that. And John and I walked in this bar. And of course, everything in Green Bay is Packer country. And they, because of John, they, they really felt like we were a couple of football players. And I was, you know, a little more shapely at that time. They thought I was, some of them thought it was Johnny and I was, which uh, we kind of, pulled it to the hill further than we should have and before we decided we needed to get out of there. But every time I went to Green Bay, I always took two suitcases and I'd bring one home full of cheese. And we would take care of all the neighbors and friends with, with pretty good cheese that most, most of us had never had before. Uh, that worked out real well and then I moved to Lubbock to take over a district. and. Uh, 
Oh, here in Lubbock is a long time. That, uh, one of the guys I did some business with out there had, had uh, been a lineman for tech when uh, Paul Horning was coming down to recruit Donnie Anderson. Donnie had been their quarterback at Tech. So this guy had some great stories to tell, particularly when, when Horning would hit town. <laughs> uh, that was probably my fondest memory of Lubbock. Uh, we were out there for a lifetime and about a year or two months or something like that. Charlotte's family uh, had an operation in out of Shawnee, they had uh, retail stores and uh, Walls Bargain Centers, Newton Wall Company. You, you've got one in Stillwater. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, we moved, moved back to, uh, to Shawnee and uh, I started a wholesale company for them, or business for them. And uh, whatever excess we had that the stores didn't need any more of, well, I'd have their leftovers to try to sell. And uh, it, it worked out quite well. It, uh, the company grew. Uh, I guess it worked out. It was paid with it for 31 years. So. What year did you move back to Shawnee? Uh, 67. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Winter of 67. Interesting about Lubbock. It was the first time I flew out there to see, see my new territory before, before the family moved. We went on treetop airlines. It's Trans Texas Airlines. Coming over Lubbock, I looked down, and the story said it, it snowed out here today. And I looked down, and everything was red. It had a dust storm come in on top of the snow, and that was my first trip. And we built a house in a new area, which was underground utilities. So there weren't any phone lines for birds to sit on. There was nothing. <laughs> it, uh, there were some good people out there. Mm -hmm. but it, uh, Just a different environment. Well, it's, uh, somebody said it's anything you ever want. 500 miles in any direction. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> no, it, uh, but anyway, we were glad to get, get to Shawnee. Or Shawnee's changed too. I guess we've all changed too. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Tell me a little bit how Shawnee's changed through the years. Uh, I think when we got here in 67, the population might have been 25,000. And it never got above 29,000 for years and years and years. Uh, the interstate started making a difference. Uh, Probably it was in the 80s that things started to get in the, a little more into it, and, but that's when about the time they built the mall, which went downtown, uh, into all kinds of political changes and things. But uh, I guess it was the, this, in the late 80s when they started the uh, high school finals rodeo thing. And, uh, it was a national group that came in and did it for three years. And Charlotte and I worked with them trying to take care of the people that would come into town from wherever. And we had a group from Nebraska, and I don't remember where all of it. Uh, that kind of got us started into the rodeo business. And we built the new expo center out there. And uh, I served on that trust authority for eight years. And uh, it's, the rodeo has just become something really big for high school kids and brings in, well, there'll be a, somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand contestants every year, and they bring their families and their horses, and yeah, it just runs over the town. And they come back as often as they can, because it's just quite a, it's almost like a homecoming for them. It brings in a lot of money. Oh, mm -hmm. big time. So that started hotels building, and uh, it just has really grown since then. I'm not sure the town itself has grown a lot. I know we passed 30,000, but the, the county has really, really grown and mm -hmm. become a trade center. Uh, what are some of the major employers in the area? Oh, uh, let's see. Well, the Potomotomy 
tribe is one of the big ones. Uh, and we've got like seven tribes that's right here in this four county area, uh, plus all the casinos. That uh, well, there's Wolverine, Mobile, uh, TDK, uh, of course, then we just recently opened, uh, well, we opened all the new stores out there. Ford Milling Company. Uh, yeah, a uh, whole bunch of them. Newton Oil Company, Ford Milling. We have four, uh, Shawnee Mills, this big one. Newton Oil Company probably, well, they've got over 100 here in Shawnee. Uh, and, but the Stillwater stores are next to the best store. But, uh, hmm. uh, and it used to be a little bitty store down on Main Street. That's pretty big in Stillwater. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's done quite well. Got a great Betty running it up there, too. Uh, just got a whole bunch of new people, uh, new stores out on the west side of town. Uh, Hobby Lobby. Chick-fil-A finally got to town. And, uh, we got, got most of the chains now. And, uh, Shawnee's a town that every time I visit always seems extremely active. If, particularly if you're trying to get somewhere in a hurry, you're behind a whole row of pickup trucks. <laughs> <laughs> it never fails. But uh, there is a lot. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of people that are active in the city. Mm -hmm. at least, uh, it's, uh, of course, there's always, always your political fights, but I think everybody has those. So, you know, my advice to anybody is stay out of politics. They have all the downtown functions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, you know, every uh, every month there's something going on downtown. Three or four different bands play and, and street vendors. And, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't compete with Bricktown, but uh, we do have a Bricktown brewery. A <laughs> uh, lot, lot of local restaurants now beside the chains. So, uh, give you a little variety to sometimes stay healthy, sometimes not. So are you retired these days? Absolutely. <laughs> I've uh, been retired about 11 years. Wow. And uh, I wake up at the crack of eight with a smile on my face. <laughs> Just uh, love it, love it. We, we go to Lake Tinker pretty regular. Uh, daughter and granddaughters in Austin and daughter and granddaughters in Walton. And go to Cabo and try to get around. Have a granddaughter, it's a junior up to Stillwater now. Uh, have two daughters go through there. Two, this is the third granddaughter. Uh, got two great granddaughters. I don't know if I'll be around before they get up there or not. Lots of orange blood. <laughs> Lots of blood, all the way back to the 20s. But, uh, are you involved with the Alumni Association? Mm -hmm. uh, I used to, they used to, before Burns came on board, they had a political Cowboys for Politics or something that's supposed to work with your local guys. But with Burns up there, we don't need anybody out here. He takes care of all of it. So that kind of fell through. But in uh, our local Pop County group is, I think I might have told you earlier, we have. Well, yeah, that's why you're here, <laughs> because the, the Pot County alums host, every summer, host the uh, graduating class, or classes from all the schools around there, going to the ones that are going to OSU, and then any students that are at OSU are invited to come in. So we host anywhere, I think there's 50 there this summer, one year there was like 80. Wow. And uh, gave out about $3,500 worth of scholarships, which is strictly by drawing their name out of a hat. But uh, they appreciate it. And the kids that come back, and you know, some of them have only been there a year. Occasionally you'll find, well, this year we had one that has just graduated. But uh, just to hear them get up and talk and, and tell these young kids what to expect and all, it's amazing. Hmm. Just makes you feel good. So it, uh, I, I'm sure there's a lot of a lot of alumni groups around the state that do this kind of thing. 
but it is it uh, certainly is for the good. Mm -hmm. hmm. How did earning your, your degree from OSU impact your life? Well, it, it always helps to put on a resume that you have a degree. Uh, I think it, everything from time management to motion, mm -hmm. that you, uh, even, even loading a truck, <laughs> which I've, I've done a lot of that, but how, how to fit the most into a smaller space. And I didn't know, it just does something about the way you think. And, Third legs and some of the, some of those things you, in in business management courses how you how you work your time and your emotions and all those things and yeah it just helps in life. And these days, how do you show your your OSU pride? Well, I'm talking to you for one. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't tell coming to your house today. <laughs> but uh, well, yeah, we're definitely known in the neighborhood. But, uh, of course, we, we, we tailgate to all the games. Uh, I did give up our basketball tickets a couple of years ago because those drive home mm -hmm. at night are a little tough on a two-lane road for old folks. Mm -hmm. uh, but we still make it to all the football games, and our tailgate group still, we've lost a couple of them, but uh, it's, there's new ones come in to replace it. Uh, granddaughters bring friends by and uh, see a lot of young kids. and. Uh, just, uh, it's something, I can't imagine any school doing more tailgating than what, you know, I hear stories about others, but just to drive across the campus and, or walk across the campus and, and see it, and it you, you gotta be proud of it, you gotta feel good about it. Mm -hmm. And then every time we drive, drive into town and drive up Monroe, and that new road that goes on up across campus and look through it and the flowers and all that, Charlotte will say, it's more beautiful this year. Still, it's just, it's not difficult to be proud of. How do you try to keep your connection and keep updated with Oklahoma State University? Well, the, uh, of course, I'm having email trouble right now, but uh, we get her. Magazines or several over there, Posse Magazine, the University of State Magazine. Uh, you have your lifetime membership. Well, yeah, a lifetime alum and get stuff from the alums and uh, talking with people. Mm -hmm. Always, always talking to people. Very seldom, I haven't found anybody yet that wasn't happy about their time at OSU or AM. Mm -hmm. but, uh, no, it's just, it's just second nature to want to be a part of it. It seems many OSU alums are, are very loyal to OSU. What is it about Oklahoma State that sparks such loyalty? <clears throat> I'd say friendship, because you're friends for life. That, uh, when you were reading on the sports page about these young guys coming up there, uh, they talk about the family. And uh, we've got a group that gets together at Grand, Grand Lake every two years. And guys coming in from Kentucky or North Carolina come back, just, you know, just get back together. And then there's probably eight to 12 of us that get together every month in Oklahoma City for lunch. And of course everybody's wanting to know what's going on on campus. But the ones from further away. It's just, uh, I'd say friendship, good friendship. Mm -hmm. But, uh, gosh, you know, I'm talking about friends from 50 some years ago, and we're in contact on a regular basis, even though we don't live anywhere near one another. So, uh, you know, guys in California are talking to them. Want to know what's going on? Mm -hmm. you know, and of course, today they can at least watch some football games, uh, and that helps. Oh yeah. But uh, but their their connection, even though they're not around, is still those memories are there. 
Well, tell me a little bit about your family as we start winding on down. <laughs> well, my family's winding on up. Uh, we've got <laughs> two great granddaughters now. Callie uh, graduated, that's the granddaughter. Her mother and dad are retired military. They live in, in Lockwood now. And, uh, spent about eight years in Italy, which almost broke us. But uh, so Callie was just going to school at OSU at that time when they moved to Italy. So we had spent a lot of time with her. She uh, she graduated, uh, had a, she had an ROTC scholarship and was the first uh, woman cadet commander in the ROTC wow. army up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, then went to that other school that has a law school and uh, the military paid for that. So uh, she's on active duty now. She was originally up to uh, in Virginia. Her, uh, her husband, who was a capsic and uh, I guess this was just a business degree. But anyway, he, when he got out, he uh, joined the Navy, went to Naval OCS, and uh, I guess he was his longest tour was almost a year. He was out on the ocean blue. But uh, anyway, they had their their first child in Virginia. And now they're at Fort Hood, Texas, and he's in the MBA, his second year of the MBA school at the UT. So uh, they're sitting pretty good. But, and they have two little girls, future little ladies. <laughs> that uh, her sister Taylor uh, was at OSU, did not finish because of health reasons, and ended up with a degree from uh, UCLA. That's the University of Cameron, Walton, America. But she was there for three years. So she needed her blood's orange. And uh, she's married to a West Pointer that's in Afghanistan right now. Uh, our other daughter, Shauna, graduated uh, out of the hotel and restaurant school. That was in, what, 88? And uh, her husband graduated a year before that, I guess. But anyway, they are, they're in uh, Austin now. And, uh, Great story he had to tell when they uh, first moved down there. He's with Accenture, and they worked with a lot of uh, the state government contracts for Medicare and Medicaid and all of that. So there's a little place called the Chili Parlor close to the Capitol where the old guys in their fancy suits go down. And they took Charles with them down there one day. They're standing in line to get their little bowl of chili and. He heard some lady behind him talking and said something about OSU. And he turned around and said, you said OSU? Uh, she said, you mean Oklahoma State? She said, yes, yes. She said, I'm the president of the local alumni chapter. He said, you're kidding, here in Austin? She said, oh, we've got a very active group here in Austin. She said, how do you, how do you get along with all these Longhorn people? She said, oh, it's easy. They hate OU more than we do. <laughs> I don't know if you can keep that. <laughs> so, so they have done quite well in Austin. Uh, their youngest daughter, who's now was a state champion tennis player two years in a row down there, and is at OSU. Uh, she was injured and had surgery and ended her tennis career, but she's a junior this year and uh, comes by all of her tailgates to get free meal. And her younger sister is a senior in uh, in Austin, and is also a tennis player. Hmm. So who have I left out? Anybody? I left a part of it. <laughs> so that, that's, I think that's most of it. Okay. That, uh, <laughs> but anyway, there's some orange blood in all of them. Oh yeah. That uh, the only only two that have well semi orange blood. Both went to West Point, so that's son-in-law and a grandson-in-law. So we will excuse that. Absolutely, absolutely. But uh, and since I'm a lonely child, I can't say much other because I'm just spoiled orange. <laughs> <laughs> well, we covered quite a bit of ground today. What have I missed? What would you like to add? Well, I want to uh, thank you for making me start to think back on some of. Some of the good times I had. 
I mean, they, they, I had a lot of good times, but uh, it's good to remember them. It's good to think about them. It, uh, you know, it helps having grandkids involved up there, but they still they let them think about all the things that you've made me think about. So I, I appreci appreciate that. And it, uh, I think your family would be very proud that you're sitting there doing this today, too. All your OSU family are probably very proud of you that you've been chosen to do this. Well, that was Charlie's fault. Well, Charlie chose you. Because <laughs> I was the oldest one there. <laughs> I'm sure Mom and Dad are looking down with a smile. Oh, face. I know they are. I know they are. And, uh, and I, frankly, I've enjoyed it. I was nervous, but I, it's uh, you're good. Well, we appreciate your time today. Yeah.